So Michaela, she's going to talk about her experiences in Dunkirk refugee camp. She has been doing extensive aid work there, and she has a few stories and photos, and I believe a film to share. It's really daunting, so um, I can't look in the eye. Oh, that's so much better. Um, I'm a lifelong migrant, although um, I'd call myself a nomad more than a, a migrant, and other people might call me an expat. Um, you know, I come from a Western nation into another Western nation, so these are some of the labels that distinguish different groups. Um, I went to um, the Curve Theatre last night where I watched a very brilliant performance by Mark Thomas, I don't know if you're familiar with him, and it was called Trespass, um, the performance, and the Trespass was by us, the public, onto land that used to be public but is now privatised, and it's quite apt for uh, the situation in the French camps, um, the Dunker camp in particular is was on public land but it's been sold for redevelopment so it's now private land and the refugees have to move off because um, the uh, developers want to start earning money. Um, but um, I just wanted to put that into contact, context. I first kind of almost accidentally stumbled upon this camp in early September when I was on my way back from the Netherlands to the United Kingdom and I'd collected some donations for refugees which weren't welcome in Calais and I had them in my car and I thought you know I'm not taking them to England so there must be other camps and I found this camp in Dunkirk um, which then as you can see just had some tents scattered around um, this great big field um, by my estimate there were maybe 300 people there then but the conditions were absolutely horrendous. There was no cooking equipment, no firewood, no fire, no cooking facilities, um, just nothing except these makeshift um, kind of tents and pallet huts. Um, came to England, pretty shocked, determined to do something about it, which coincided with um, here in Leicestershire and pretty much all over the United Kingdom, solidarity groups being set up, and um, myself and my partner Alan kind of fell in with Ali Solidarity and although we're strictly speaking still independents, we go to the camps as, basically as and when we please. We do have Ali Solidarity backing and we do take their donations along. So um, this was the one and only water point in September, so 300 people with one tap. Um, this is me going back out in October with my car jammed full, absolutely chock-a-block full of blankets, sleeping bags, tents, um, clothes, whatever would fit and whatever seemed useful. Um, as you can see, the, um, this is only a month after I was first there. The camp's already a lot fuller, There's, the tents are much closer together, there's mess building up. <coughs> Um, this is, uh, these are two volunteers from the team whose arrival in Dunkirk coincided with my own. I was by myself and they were a team of about 20 people. They're from Bristol, they're called A Box Convoy, they're absolutely brilliant people, each and every one of them. But again, you can see the rows of tents are now, so it's becoming denser. Um, also here you can still see the road and um, what I did during the week I spent there was just desperately, because the situation was so desperate, by then there were already a thousand people, so in a month 700 new people had arrived. Um, and I, I was just driving around looking for piles of firewood, for, for um, discarded cardboard boxes, anything that would burn, anything that people could eat, um, storming off to Calais to fetch more sleeping bags, more tents. Um, and it was just, um, and you, you could see this little boy has got a bit of a broken chair that would maybe burn for half an hour, and he was just absolutely delighted, like a, a little bit of warmth. 
and this is a shower block that was put in place in October that's still there, the showers are freezing cold. Um, strictly speaking, I think the rules are that you're allowed eight minutes of showering per person or something, but part of the intimidation that's taking place there now, um, say an entire family with four or five children may be given ten minutes to shower. So um, showers are used as a, um, a, a weapon or as a, a, a means of intimidation. This is another camp. This is deeper into France, more towards um, Saint-Omer. It's called Noran Fontes. The population here are mostly Africans. They are um, Eritrean, Ethiopian, Sudanese, Somali. Um, and uh, it's a much smaller camp. It was 150 people back in October. It's now about 250 with other camps sprouting up as people are leaving Calais because of the threat of eviction, they are kind of falling back onto um, these <coughs> kinds of camps. Um, this is yet another camp in a, a tiny little hovel called Tatingham, where I found 40 um, Afghani and uh, Iraqi men living with absolutely nothing except firewood. They had plenty of wood, but no clothes, no food, no, no nothing at all. Um, I don't actually know what's become of that camp. I kind of handed over the responsibility to people who were <coughs> on the ground more permanently. Um, I came back after the October visit pretty distraught and destroyed and just <coughs> acutely conscious of how little my work had meant for a whole week, just constantly being on the go, and yet it was not enough and not enough. And then somebody put this on my timeline and um, it's kind of helped put things in perspective you know if you only put a smile on one child's face if you only keep one person warm for the night um, um, and then um, in mid-January Alan and myself went back to Dunkirk and if it bothers to play this is the situation there now. It's a city with 20,000 of people and there's 3,000 refugees inside. I'm 22 years old. At the beginning I was with French charity. It was just a one hour, two hour. It was not enough, it's never enough. So I decided to be independent. He's Syrian. He wants to go back to Turkey. When I've met him, he was very hungry. I found him out of the street. This guy, he's, he's my angel. Even if we don't understand each other, I love him. And this is Besh. <laughs> Look up to the help of the police, you know, on side and inside. So all them is broken, not working. Yeah, sometimes you know, chemistry is like a bit of a diary. You have to keep like, oh, come on! <laughs> this is all life. Sometimes it's funny. Sometimes you have to cry for 3,000 people to get them. They need proper showers, toilets, medical shelter for emergencies. There's nothing like this here. They are not used to beg, you know, in the country. And when you see them, they are smiling, they are happy or something. But their inside is bleeding. She came on herself with her four kids. 
recently she had a miscarriage because of the condition of the camp. How a pregnant lady can live here? They run away from death and they will die in this developed country. It's unfair. There's a lot of kids who are very mature for the age. Even when we, we are in the school, they are driving pictures of you know, boats, army. It's not normal for a kid. So she's an independent volunteer in the camp. There's too many people with egos that think they know everything and there's nobody getting off their bones, yes. getting into their vehicles, coming here and physically doing the work and making it happen. That's what we need. And that's what independent people can do. So we do. Okay. How in 2016, in a civilised country, in a civilised society, is this allowed to happen? For whatever political reasons, humanitarian reasons, you cannot get human beings. You wouldn't let animals live like this. And we're condoning human beings to this. Children, babies, people will die. This winter, people will die. Only refugees have a big hope with the UN. The I think it's the last the last chance for them. If the UN do don't do anything, I don't know what's happened here. I don't know. Some people have a lot of cliches about them. I think it's important for them to come here to see what's the truth of the world. That's why I want to say to the people who don't know the refugees. the situation now in 2016 that's uh, I think a film was shot in December so over the winter conditions have got a lot worse uh, mud comes up to your knees you know it's literally you wear wellies and you might just see the mud unmingled with feces just drips inside it's um, and children children play in this and people eat in this it's impossible to keep clean it's impossible to wash your hands before preparing food or eating food it's rife with disease um, so, uh, these pictures were all taken in, uh, during our recent trip in January, February. This is uh, back to the camp at Noron Fontes, which is the African camp. As I said, this is now grown to 250 people. The sheer volume of donations from all over Europe, which are all very well intentioned, but it's such that a lot of it ends up being unused because there's nowhere to store anything. So this is just one rack of shoes. Um, this is the gold shelter in Noir Fontes. I think about 40 girls sleep in a uh, wooden shed together, <coughs> literally uh, one next to the other. This is um, back in the Dunker camp. This is the lady you saw in the film who had a miscarriage, her little child Leah never smiles, you just, you can make a complete and utter fool of yourself, but she just does not smile. She's really sad. This boy is Miran, he is 13. He spends all day, every day, going to the lay-by where the donations runs from all over Europe pull up, just sourcing stuff for his family. His father isn't in the camp and he's presumably the man of the household. He's got very old eyes for his age. He should be in school, he should be playing football. Um, maybe thinking about, you know, a first girlfriend or something, and instead he just goes around going, asking for shoes, asking for food, for, for gas. Sometimes he, has a, he manages to get a wheelbarrow, sometimes he has a rucksack, so it makes it a little easier for him to transport things. The reason vans pull up in the lay-by and not into the camp is because since um, the... Uh, the attacks in Paris, uh, the police have closed off the camp and will only let very specific things in. For example, um, no tents, no construction materials, no tools, nothing at all that can be used to build semi-permanent shelters, even if the pallets are used, are, are needed to lift tents out of the mud so people can at least sleep dry. That is not allowed. Pallets are building materials full stop. Um, this means that 
vans have to pull up in a lay-by, but even then um, the Kurdish people cannot bring these materials into the camp because they are stopped and searched, each and every one of them. The police are very fickle with their rules. Sometimes you can't bring in camping gas, other days you can't bring in uh, blankets, third days you can't bring in food. It just changes from one second to the next at their whim, almost. Um, this is a family that I met in October. Oh, not a family, it's just the children. They are now safe in, um, they live in Rotherham. Um, it's Inaz, who's 13, J Jason, who's 10, and the little girl, Zilan, who's three, um, with their elder sister, Zina, and two parents, the six of them, came across in a freezer truck at minus 25 degrees. They spent 18 hours in this freezer truck and barely survived the journey. But they are safe and well. Um, this is um, in, when I went to visit them in their new home. Jason literally opened the door and flew around my neck and went, Michaela, I have a room, I have a room, come and see my room, I have a room, please come see my room. And you can imagine, you know, after you've been in a tent camp for three to four months, that this room was nothing by our standards. There's no pictures of Spider-Man, no Spider-Man curtains, no nothing on the walls, just a bare room, but it was paradise to him. This man is um, Haitham, and Haitham was a doctor in uh, Sudan, and the, the hospital that he and a colleague worked at what came up for redevelopment. Uh, for it, it was going to be demolished and the land was going to be developed. And he campaigned to save the hospital because it served a valuable function to the community. And um, he, he was arrested and um, I think he was tortured, though he didn't say in so many words. And then he was released again, but he kept up the work that he was doing because he believed in it. And then his colleague who supported him, uh, who also campaigned with him, had a, a car accident and died and it just put the fear of God in him and he just ran and um, ended up in the camp in Laurent Fontes. This is um, Taha, uh, who's from Ethiopia. He's in yet another camp in a place called Stanvorde, also in, in France. Um, he was quite a, a political well, maybe not a political activist, but he certainly campaigned for, for certain things. And um, while he was distributing leaflets and, and that kind of thing, he just uh, felt increasingly uncomfortable. People were talking about him behind his back. People were pointing. Um, he just, again, um, whether it's paranoia, whether it's real, that kind of fear is not for us to judge. But he got scared enough to go on the run. Um, the person sitting on the right is Kinfe. He is also from Ethiopia. Had a similar story about being arrested, being put in prison, and then his father paid <coughs> to get him out of prison. But then he was being watched very closely. Was arrested again. Was brought out again, and then he just ran. And he's now in Glasgow, and he's very happy. Uh, these are. This is Saber. Uh, whom we met during our last trip in Dunkirk with his family. Uh, that's the lady on the kind of in the middle, bottom left middle. She's Baha, she's his wife. And the lady in at the top in the middle, she's um, Amina. She's uh, Moshao's wife. Her, the whole side of her body is actually burnt by a bomb. Uh, oh, there's supposed to be a video clip here, but I don't know where that's gone. Um, So if you can just tell us what life is like in Iraq at the moment. Uh, uh, I'm talking about the Kurdistan. This is the part of Iraq, you know. Uh, we haven't good, uh, we haven't got a good president in our country. You no, know, we haven't got uh, electric, water, right, and 
freedom and some young people is going to college when they finish to have anywhere for the working like the job and uh, no salary some some uh, somebody like the teacher or an engineer about four months four months uh, the government they didn't pay the salary for the these people right uh, but the American government and British government and European government they supposed our president and they know what he's like yeah yeah uh, our president is not good we don't like him mm. yeah okay thank you very much okay Hi, what's your name? Joan. 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 Hi, Joan. I'm Michaela. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Joan. Where are you from? From Syria. And, and what, why are you here now? I am here because the war, I accept from the war. All every place in the Syria, it's war. Fighting together. People, civil people fighting together. It's a civil war between all the people in the Syria. And, and what is it? You speak very good English. Or how come? What did you do in Syria? Uh, You're educated, clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have two universities, business, four years, and uh, English translation, two years. And I work in the bank. I am officer in the bank, ten years ago. And I take the... Uh, I took uh, vacation from the government, and after uh, one year, the vacation is uh, finished, and uh, I uh, try to renew this vacation, but the government don't accept because I am outside the city. You know that. Right. Yeah. Okay. And now you find yourself uh, in the jungle. Yeah. And you're hoping to go to England. Why? Yeah. Why England? Because I have two brothers there. One of them he is uh, citizens. Uh, British and uh, British uh, national. national, and another is uh, is Rafiji. and uh, I want to go there because you know when my brother there, I can my brother can help me and uh, complete my dad with my life. My brother is better. Okay, what, what does your brother do in in England? He have a small company working stainless steel, Aaron. You know Aaron stainless steel work. Uh, Make uh, tables, make uh, this wood. So he's, he's self-employed. He has a small business. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. work. Uh, he depended uh, on himself. Uh, himself. Right. Yeah. And, and what do you want for yourself in England? I think I want. Uh, I hope to complete my study to study a master and doctor in English. I like that okay. and love. That but I don't know. Maybe if I arrive to England, I will complete my study, and I can work and uh, complete my study. Okay. And if, if the war in Syria ends, would you go back? If yeah, it's yeah, yeah, if yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I don't need uh, anything in Syria. Syria. I have agriculture land. I have uh, uh, English lessons, uh, special lessons uh, uh, for t uh, students in Syria. Nice. I studied. Uh, and uh, children and uh, high school, uh, secondary school uh, students. Yeah. And uh, I am officer in the bank. I d didn't need anything. A ma manager, bank manager? Yeah. Uh, yeah. A counter. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, we. Right, so that was Joan. I need to. Am I going over yes. time? Right. Yes, you read it out of time. All right, I'll very quickly finish. And this is uh, Zuad, she's from Eritrea. And I looked into Eritrea a little bit because there's no war there, so why are these people escaping? 
well, apparently since the war there's been a, a totalitarian regime with never-ending conscription. So you're conscripted as soon as you leave school and you just stay in the military. That's for boys and for girls. There's only one career path and that's prostitution. Uh, this is our very good friend Farzan, who's from Syrian, uh, Syrian part of Kurdistan. He would really like to go to Liverpool because he supports Liverpool football team. Um, and um, he told us that in Syria you're not allowed to have a Kurdish name, so Kurdish people have to have an Arabic name. You're not allowed to speak Kurdish in public. Uh, you can't insult your president for fear of going to prison for your life. Um, and this is us distributing um, some goods from the van. And this man is uh, Halmat. I met him in October in the camp. He told me he was a dentist also from Kurdistan. And he'd come, he tried to get to England because he felt he didn't earn enough back home and he wanted to earn more. He thought he could do a master's degree and then maybe a PhD and earn more money. Now, he would be classed by the Daily Mail or within this uh, narrative of economic migrants versus refugees. He would be an economic migrant. He's gone back to Kurdistan. He didn't have the bottle to survive the camp. Um, right, anyway, I'll cut it short here. Thank and you, thank you. Sorry, it's I okay. have no more time to talk. Thank you very much.